the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere is very different. So if we look at the South Pole and the North Pole, the North Pole being on the left here, we can see that the land to water ratio in the North Pole is essentially one to one, uh, whereas the land to, to water ratio in the southern hemisphere is almost 15 to one. And this, of course, has significant implications for dispersal and how things move around um, in the Southern Ocean. But I think Antarctica is probably best known in the, you know, out there for the work on climate change and um, it's not, and rightly so, because the area in the, in the globe that is actually heating up the most at the moment is the West Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so if you want to experience climate change the most, this is essentially where you need to go. This is the place that's heating up the most. Um, if we look at Antarctic mass um, variation, the land mass is actually decreasing significantly over time. But what's quite interesting is that sea ice is actually extending. Um, but let's talk about the terrestrial area. This is just a, a model, a 3D, 3D model of Antarctica. What we have here is the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Um, this is the East Ant uh, Antarctica, this um, solid block. Here's the peninsula with some of the glaciers down here. And a paper that recently appeared um, in Science actually says that they looked at, at um, satellite pictures of Antarctica over 20 odd or so years. And we're actually losing the sea ice at a 70% faster rate than what we thought initially. So land ice is melting, ice is melting in Antarctica 70% faster than what we ever thought. And most of those melting is actually occurring here. So the circles of the red is showing you the loss of sea ice. But what is quite interesting is that some areas are actually getting colder. So one should never talk about climate warming, you should talk about climate change. Because some areas, for example, up here, are actually getting colder and we're building up ice in those areas. Um, so just to put this in perspective, um, if we look at the ice that's actually melting in Antarctica, 15% of the ice is melting in these huge regions here, or we're losing 50% of the ice, or 15, whereas 55% comes from these small ice shelves here. Recently, this led towards the end of last year um, for a whole bunch of Antarctic researchers to get together and to establish these six priority areas for Antarctic research and not surprising one of those areas are to understand how and why the ice sheets are actually melting. Just to put this in a little bit of perspective, there's 26.5 million cubic kilometers of ice in Antarctica and if we lose all of that sea levels will rise by 60 meters. So we sold our house in Somerset West just in time. 60 meter rise in sea level if we lose the ice in Antarctica. But these six key research questions, um, just for interest sake, this is the um, Sinai for the, the research station in Antarctica. These six research questions essentially align very well with the South African National Antarctic Program, the mission, which is essentially to increase our understanding of the natural environment and life in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean through appropriate science. I will focus on Marion Island because this is where a lot of my work is actually based. So Marion Island is essentially 2,000 kilometers southeast of Cape Town. Um, just to point it out, so that's Cape Town more or less there. Antarctica and the Prince Edward Islands or Marion Island is essentially there. So it's about four or five days on the SAO Gallus um, heading south. Politically, these islands fall under Cape Town jurisdiction or the Western um, pr um, uh, Province. They comprise two islands, the Prince Edward Island, which is the smallest of the two, and then Marion Island, which is essentially 316 square kilometers. The highest peak in the central area is more or less the height of Table Mountain. What is important is that it's been declared a special nature, nature reserve, so it's afforded special protection. Um, it's also the tip of a shield volcano, so the la latest volcanic eruption was two or three years ago, and the island is approximately 500,000 years old. When you stand on Marion Island and you look towards the northeast, you can see Prince Edward Island, which is the second island, 
about 19 kilometers away. This picture um, reminds me to tell you that Marion Island is cold. The, the average temperature is about 5 degrees, um, with temperatures of um, down to minus 40 in the central plateau. But Marion Island is severely affected by climate change. There was a permanent ice sheet in the interior, which we lost in 2004. No more permanent ice. Um, what is quite good is that we've got very accurate data from Marion Island from about 1960 onwards. So if you then look at that, we can see that rainfall decreased from more or less uh, 2,800 millimeters to 2,000 millimeters. Um, temperature increased by more or less two or three degrees in the same time period. But what is important is that the number of rain-free days are actually or increasing, so the number of sunny days between the days that it rained is actually increasing. So it's a complete change in the climate. Marion Island was also extensively glaciated during the last glacial maximum. Um, remember because it's so far south, and the blue there just essentially shows you the extent of um, glaciation about 13,000 years ago, which means that no, none of the species could have remained there. They all survived in these refugia, which essentially remained ice-free. And these are from models, um, but we think that there were a few areas that actually remained ice-free. Marion Island is also a volcanic island, so a lot of it is, is black or more recent, and then also gray, the older lava. So what we did uh, through collaboration with geomorphologists was that we were actually able to describe a very prominent geological lineament or a feature that runs across the island. And the reason for telling you these things is because these features significantly influence the genetic patterns that we see. So the patterns for a large number of um, arthropods and invertebrates and also plant species that we looked at are remarkably congruent. The first thing that's very important is that genetic diversity is very high. And in spite of considerable sampling effort, we've not actually reached a plateau. So diversity is very high. Um, it's, and this high diversity is driven by the heterogeneous landscape. Remember, it's a volcanic island. There's also geological lineaments, but also by the variable climatic conditions. It's been glaciated 13,000 years ago, so all the individuals across the island must have either recolonized the island or spread from these refugia. Um, but the climate is also very different across the island. So the western side of the island is a much harsher environment than the eastern side because of the westerlies, it's situated in that westerly, um, in the roaring 40s, which means all the westerly winds essentially come from one side. If we then look, and I'm just going to use this as an example, at the flightless moth um, work, then we see that there are essentially three large genetic groups. But what is quite interesting is that if we put the groups in, um, if we look at it at the, against the backdrop of this geological feature, then we see that it actually, this geological feature, actually structures genetic diversity in this flightless moth. And similarly, if we look at this mite species, um, remember that the island was significantly or hugely glaciated. So what we would expect is that individuals survived in these glacial-free or ice-free areas. And those are areas where your highest genetic diversity should be, and that is then exactly what we see. So the areas of highest genetic diversity correspond very well, we are in fact supporting these reconstructions, these model reconstructions, and saying that the genetic data support these ice-free areas and exactly where they were. At very small spatial scales, um, we've also done two or three studies there, and I'll tell you the importance of that now. This is Marion Island and Prince Edward Island, and if you can see, the wind essentially comes around Antarctica. So all the wind and the weather comes from the western side, and you can very clearly see that, where all the clouds essentially build up on the western side, and the eastern side is, is much calmer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this cushion plant. It's a keystone plant on Marion Island. And what we did was we looked at dispersal distance. So I'm here, and where are my offspring? At what point are plants no longer really directly related? And what you can see is that these distances are very small, so the distis dispersal distance in these plants are very small. But what is quite interesting is that it exactly matches the wind direction. So the wind is predominantly driving dispersal 
in this cushion plant. Because this is such a harsh environment, um, what is quite interesting, and this is one of the first times that we've ever, or that in the literature they've ever been able to show of intraspecific facilitation. So that plants actually help each other to survive in this harsh environment. If you go to, these plants essentially grow as cushions. Um, so if you go and you sample these cushions a few places across the cushion, only in the smallest cushion or is it actually only one individual? The moment that the cushion grows a little bit, you can see that it's in fact two individuals that have started growing together into a single growth form. And if you look at these large areas, then you can see every color is essentially a different individual. So it really is facilitation between plants to help each other to survive. And this feeds back completely to, at the very largest scale, um, which is a paper that we were very lucky to just have accepted in applied ecology, um, looking at Marion Island, where we were able to document an ecosystem collapse on Marion Island, where if you look at the top picture, um, this is a picture taken in 2001, exactly the same area taken in 2007, and you can see that there are almost no plant species left. So this is a whole ecosystem collapse documented across the sub-Antarctic island which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And if you then think a little bit about it, pictures, for example, here of these azarella plants that are dying, there's always a section of the plant that is dead and a section that actually remains green. And if you then look back at and remember what we said about that it's different individuals, it might be that specific individuals have a better resistance to this pathogen and are actually able to survive this pathogen. Um, what is not good news is if you look across all of these southern um, ocean islands, if you look at genetic diversity and inbreeding, then you can see that those plants on Macquarie Island are in fact incredibly inbred, which means that there's very low genetic diversity there. Turning back to the beginning, saying that your genetic diversity is in fact your evolutionary potential and your ability to adapt to change. So if you don't have that genetic diversity, you simply can't adapt to change. I'm going to end off now with two slides. And the first one is an extract from a horizon scan for global conservation issues, which was done in 2013. They do these every year. And they essentially look around. They bring a lot of journalists, scientists, and so together. And they do a horizon scan. What are the conservation issues that are important that we are not paying enough attention to? And one of the issues highlighted in 2013 is essentially what is the effect of loss of species on ecosystem well-being? So there are two, two viewpoints. The one says that there's a lot of redundancy in your ecosystem. There are a lot of species that do exactly the same thing. So if we lose an impala in Kruger National Park, nobody should worry because there's zebra and wildebeest that all sort of perform the same function. So don't worry about impala. We can lose them. We still have zebra and wildebeest. But the other viewpoint says we actually don't know. We just don't know what the effect on that ecosystem will be if we lose single species. The whole Kruger National Park might collapse if we lose impala. We simply don't know. And then my last slide essentially is an extract that says, we are at a critical junction for the conservation in the study of biological diversity. Such an opportunity will never occur again. We are really at a junction. Understanding and maintaining that diversity is the key to humanity's continued prosperous and stable existence on Earth. And I think this is quite a good note to end off. We really are at a critical junction, and everything that we do every day will make a difference to our children's lives. Thank you very much. Uh, I personally enjoyed it. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but uh, as an engineer, we do use biological principles to try to solve uh, uh, engineering problems. You know, instead of talking about genetics, we'll be talking, we talk about uh, genetic algorithm. You know. But uh, the ideas uh, would have come from, from the biological sciences. Now we come to uh, that uh, time when 
we officially inaugurate uh, Professor Van Fielen, and I'm going to ask uh, the ex the acting uh, dean to come and join me, and also Professor Van Fielen to to come forward so that we can formally inaugurate you. University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.